This is Tell Me What to Read, powered by Booktopia. I'm Nick Wasiliev, and today we sit down for a special collection of interviews around homegrown Australian storytellers. First up, Ben sits down with Claire G. Coleman to discuss her brand new book, Enclave. Then, Ben sits down with Paul Daly to discuss his brand new book, Jesus Town. And then finally, Sarah sits down with Kate Forsyth to discuss her brand new novel, The Crimson Thread. Check the show notes below for timestamps for all interviews, and if you are enjoying our show, you can drop us a review on Apple Podcasts, a like on Spotify, or wherever you are listening to our show. Now, over to Ben's interview with Claire G. Coleman, author of Enclave, which you can purchase in the description right now from booktopia.com.au. Hello, I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's Fiction Category Manager. With me today is Claire G. Coleman. She's a Noongar woman who lives and writes on Wurundjeri country, and her books include The Incredible Terry Nullius, The Old Lie, Lies, Damn Lies, and her new novel Enclave, which uh, I've just read and she's just been signing here at Booktopia, uh, and it's brilliant. Uh, Claire, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Enclave, let's talk about it. Um, it's, I, I guess I would describe the work as post-colonial speculative fiction. Do you feel all right with that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that, except um, the problem, I mean, I find the phrase post-colonial um, problematic because Australia is not really post-colonial. Still got we? the Union Jack, don't we? Yeah, we still, we still do. Um, technically, Australia is still um, an act of colony, act of colonisation, so we, we can't really call it post-colonial. And I don't think... The whole idea of post-colonial fiction in Australia is is really difficult concept because of that. Mm. And um, but yeah, it is. It is. Um, I suppose anti-colonial. Yeah, let's like <laughs> let's, let's use that. I like that anti-colonial fiction. Uh, it's totally set my mind ablaze. It's uh, it's not, it's not a long book, but it 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 has got a huge imaginative scope. It's got a, it's got a lot of content. So, um, do you want to introduce our readers to it? Uh, sure. Um, Enclave um, is a story about a a society that has isolated itself from everyone who's not um, straight, white, um, heterosexual, and middle class. So they're one of those. If, if you imagine the most isolationist. Um, enclosed suburbs we've got and just extrapolate that a bit and it's kind of that's what the enclave is and it follows the story of of Christine who's from an extremely privileged family within that within that enclave but for whom it's not quite right that it's not exactly the place she belongs really yeah and we 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 enter her perspective we the first the first thing you tease us with is this um this enormous wall that, that covers this place, but then we we go into her her world, and it is incredibly closed off. Uh, and then it, it almost reminds me of The Handmaid's Tale a bit, in that you just you just put the reader inside, mm. and then and then you slowly unpeel the layers for them, and then um, as you know, as the reader's imagination, you kind of just uh, paint in um, what you, what you really think is happening here, um, and it's all it's all through the eyes of Christine, so who who the hell is Christine? Well, Christine is a um, incredibly privileged um, young white woman, middle class, early twenties. Basically, she's the 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 very much the the mainstream um, uh, the mainstream new adult fiction character, really. Yeah, right. Except she's not. <laughs> um, she's. Oh, superficially, that character, the yeah. um, the the character that's in that, um, in a way, kind of like a, a white every woman. Like the if you think of like the every man, the character could be anyone. Christine is an every woman. She could be any white, um, white girl. But yeah, she's someone who, although life has given her everything she could ever want, is still dissatisfied. Yeah, and um. And really, some people, if they if they put in a apparent 
utopia slash dystopia. Because the thing about um, what I was um, playing with is this idea that utopia is always dystopias and dystopia is always utopias. Mm. So for every dystopia, there's someone who wants it that way or it wouldn't be like that. And every utopia, there's someone who's suffering. So Christine is um, someone who would, you would think would be happy in this dystopia because she's one of the people who it's a utopia for. Yeah, and yet she's elite. not happy. And we follow her day to day. And it's it's really unapparent <laughs> what it is she actually does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that is a compliment. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's, you mean, that, that you kind of get that feeling for her entire family. Yeah, and um, I wonder if that, that is, the, <laughs> that is the, the life of wealth. I think that is a life of wealth that um, we, we, we all, we've all met, well, I don't know if everyone has, but a lot of people have met the, the kind of classic CEO type guys who it's like, what do they actually do? Like there's people out there who they, they, say, they claim things like being a managing director or a um, chairman of the board of a company is difficult, but then you find out they've got the managing director of five or six companies or the yep. chairman of the board of multiple companies, it can't be that hard if they can do it for multiple companies at once. They can't be working very hard, can they? Well, they're certainly earning very hard. <laughs> well, they're earning a lot. <laughs> but, I've, uh, th- but, yeah, you hear about people who are, uh, yeah, chair of the board for like five or six companies. How? I mean, so obviously while they're m- people who have set up this whole thing where we look at um, these wealthy people and think that they're obviously working hard, maybe they're not. Yeah, it's... Um, we're getting very political, but I guess that's the whole point. Uh, the way I, I kind of see it is, is there's neoliberalism trying to, tries to attach a, a moral good to wealth and, yes. uh, and, and converse, like it kind of criminalises poverty. Absolutely. And, and the enclave called Safe Town in, in the novel mm. is, is basically neoliberalism gone completely batshit insane. Yes, even more so. <laughs> even, more, even more than it is. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, it's what happens if you extrapolate and the, um, the neoliberal path we have been on, which I think we're probably still on, although we've had a change of government. I don't know if that much has changed. But you extrapolate the path we've been on for the last, I don't know, 20 years at least, maybe longer, um, extrapolate that into the future and what would happen. Yeah, and I feel like uh, there's... Hearing about the kind of uh, techno surveillance capitalism that's going on uh, in places like China at the moment, yeah. that, um, and, that and, and we voluntarily bring it on ourselves. Yeah, surveillance right, right. capitalism, right? Um, there's a saying among among some hackers on on social media, which is when a product is free, you're, you're the, the product. Product, yeah, <laughs> and, and and that's what it is. Facebook is free because Facebook is selling your data. That's yes. why it's free. Or they're selling you you to advertising. Free to air TV is free because it's paid for by advertising, which is you being the product. It's being able to force not um, advertising into your eyes is why which, free to air TV exists. Which is, um, I guess, okay if if you can cognitively um, choose to go into that. But if uh, if if you're just in it. <laughs> yeah, if right. if this thing called safety net is in your phone and it just it's sends a car to your house because it knows you need the car before you do, ooh, that's the well. We're not the funny thing is um, algorithms aren't far from that. No, we're, we're actually not far from that from that situation now. We have things like um, there's rumours that um, that Uber's capable of sending cars where they think there's going to be a surge. Of, of interest it's not that's not far from that um we, we already have a situation where if i pick up my phone and try and get an uber it's going to su- it's going to suggest places it knows i'm probably that have been recently or might want to go again right it, we're already doing that sort of thing um i don't know if you've ever noticed but you pick up your phone you search for a place and um google maps will tell you how busy it is currently yes which means that surveilling everyone's phones Tell you how many phones are in that place. How useful and terrifying, right? It's useful and terrifying, and um, it's like the, the Chinese surveillance situation is is one thing because that's kind of forced on people by their government. But with in Australia and the UK and USA, yep. particularly those three countries, particularly, 
we are under constant surveillance that we have voluntarily taken on. Mm. That's something to think about. Uh, yeah, that, it's, it's one, something I wanted to pause on because the the surveillance that that, that kind of dominates Christine's world, um, you would think so much of it is the drones humming in the air and the the cameras that just kind of dot her eyeline all the time. But I think a lot of it is the device in her hand. Yes, absolutely. And that that's, I mean, I think that's um, fairly clear in, in Christine's world that um, that the device in her hand is doing a lot of the, lot of the surveillance. And um, and that's, again, that's, that's the world we're in. We are in a world where um, our phones are constantly doing surveillance on us. Um, jumping forward, actually... One other thing, I, I I wanted to pause on the uh, the surveillance capitalism thing, but I also wanted to to pause on the the booze in this world, <laughs> uh, particularly the, uh, Christine and her mum. Yeah, it's just so much booze. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it reminded me of Wake and Fright. The amount of just like I felt sick reading it. Well, it's it's, I mean, it's perfectly clear that. Um, that um, Christine's mum is a relatively well functioning alcoholic. I mean, that's perfectly that's that's pretty obvious. Mm. Um, and it's it's really easy to be a, a so called functioning alcoholic when you're middle class. Yes, because um, you can afford good booze. You can afford to skip a day of work because you're hungover. You can afford to not work at all if you're rich enough. So it's there's this phenomenon that people used to talk about for a lot, which is. Um, the uh, level of drug taking or drinking that would put a, um, a working class person on the street, middle class people don't even suffer f- don't, consequences. Don't even they, just, they, just, they just do it. There's even cases of, in history of, um, of um, I remember reading a news story years ago of a, um, like a wealthy general practitioner who was addicted to heroin and no one knew. Because he could afford to be addicted to heroin without having to be on the street or begging for money or anything. That's uh, also terrifying. <laughs> We're being terrified a lot today. Uh, so the mother is a is a functioning alcoholic. What does what what motivates the father? Um, I well to my to me, um, Christian's father is motivated entirely by power. Yeah, not, just not, preserving not greed, that. but preserving his yeah. his position, his power, and in in a way, although I, um, I think it I, I kind of I covered a bit in the novel, but not really explicitly. Um, for people with with power, the fear of losing that power is their strongest motivator. Oh yeah. Um, for people who, um, who are have power and wealth, they're scared of, of slipping down the social ladder. Yes, and that's kind of what motivates Christine's dad, the father, being this this fear of no longer being in the same position he was before. You take the reader without spoiling too much outside of the the walls of this this enclave, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and you take them into this place, the the, the wasteland, as it's yep. kind of known, um, and that's that's where the book becomes even more wild in a sense because uh, uh, what, what you're really seeing in that space is people who have been exiled from this mm. so-called utopia um, and it's people who've had uh, an omnipresent level of service in their life and mm. uh, shelter and wealth as um, a given and they have to function in uh on just like the earth, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how that, did that, you how did you imagine that? How did you paint that? Well, if with the, the um, part of part of what may what may be able to write that so well is I have a history myself of homelessness, right? Of living on the streets, and the, the people don't who never. It's it's kind of obvious when you think about it, but it never occurs to people that the people who who live on the streets have got incredible survival skills. Yes. They haven't died. You know, they've been eating out of bins and living in, uh, sleeping under a blanket on the, under, in a bush, on a like bus shelter, and survived it. And I often imagine what would happen if someone who's not 
when, when, when people first appear on the streets, they're not, they're not really good at coping and they eventually learn. So, and I think, always think people who are really privileged are going to suffer the worst. And that's kind of a, one of these recurring th- um, tropes that's coming up in apocalyptic fiction right, lately is the rich people really suffering during the apocalypse. And the poor people go, no, this is, this is, what's the difference? I mean, I was poor before, I'm poor now. I was hungry yesterday, I'm hungry now, the aliens have come or whatever. So this kind of, this idea that um, the more privilege someone has, the harder their life is when that privilege is taken away. Yes, the harder they fall. The harder they fall, yeah. That's interesting because, you know, you, you read stories about um, Silicon Valley uh, billionaires who are buying up swathes of land in New Zealand to build bunkers and be ready yeah. for everything to go to shit. But do you think you and me would actually go all right? <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think you know, those Silicon Valley millionaires buying bunkers, I often wonder if they did that, who would do their security? Yeah, right? who, who keeps the bunker a bunker? Who keeps the bunker safe? Who delivers their groceries or who delivers their food? Who... Um, some of them talk about building this utopian town where they grow, can grow their own crops and, and all that stuff. So well, who's going go to grow the crops? And who's to say that somebody who's um, the head of their security won't shoot them and take their bunker? Yes. Yeah? It's, um, there's, there's t- to my mind, there's two ways to survive in a, a kind of dystopia or an apocalyptic spasm, and that's individually and stabbing everyone else in the back and being really super strong yourself – or actually having the respect of the people around you so that, that everyone, so that people will help you out. And that's kind of, they're the only two ways to survive this sort of situation. The people who are going to build, um, who are going to try and build safe, on, um, safe enclaves, mm. if they're going to fall, they're going to collapse. Because they certainly, if there's no laws to tell people they can't steal from, their owner, from the owners of the land, and the owners of the land don't have some way to defend themselves, they're going to, they're going to be robbed. Yeah. And I, I guess it's it's a the act of building that wall is a defiance of progress. It's like it's saying we want to we want to go back. This world yes. is like we want to we want to pause here and keep what we've got. Yeah. And you know, Rome built walls. Trump tried to build a wall. Uh, ancient China built a wall. Yep. But they, they didn't last. And and you know it doesn't last. And I think once people I think once people build the wall. It, it, uh, walls to keep people out or also keep people in. Yes. And that's, um, and that's kind of the thing people can be, should be concerned about. I mean, I remember in, in the movie The Day After Tomorrow. Right. Um, there's a scene where, you know, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's... Jake pocket. Gyllenhaal and the, the Ice Age kind of comes. Yeah, the Ice Age yep. comes. But the Ice Age comes abruptly and wipes out, makes America unlivable almost mm. in like... In a day, in twenty four hours, America becomes unlivable. The day after tomorrow. The day after tomorrow. <laughs> so this twenty four hours, you, the USA has to evacuate. They go, they have to evacuate everyone as many people as can south, and they get to the, to the Mexican border, and Mexico closes the border. How satisfying! And it's like <laughs> that, that's kind of what will happen if if you if the America goes to um, people from Mexico, you're not welcome here. Well, why would they welcome you? It's the same thing. Why would anyone put up with um, isolationists wanting to leave their isolation suddenly? We should just abolish borders, I guess. Um, uh, the next thing I'm going to ask about, um, keeping on the subject of defying neoliberalism or defying mm-hmm. colonisation, uh, what what is the relationship in, in your eyes um, between uh, queerness and revolt against the occupier or revolt against the capitalist well, world that we're in. There's, there's plenty of evidence when you look at history that um, restrictions against queer, queerness, against being gay or bi or, or trans or genderqueer or whatever, all those restrictions were based around maintaining the, uh, maintaining the patriarchy. And the patriarchy exists so that Land men with land know who they know for certain they're going to have a son who will inherit the land and then pass on to their children. So it's all about the passage of of land, and land was the first version of capital. Mm. So capitalism, like and neoliberalism and um, heteronormativity, 
are kind of are built into each other. They they kind of they they both they need each other to operate. Of course, once one and of course once you remove the patriarchal division, say, and once you have the idea that women can own capital, then restrictions against homosexuality become less urgent. But and so, in the world where only men can own land or own capital, restrictions against homosexuality were extremely important to maintain that status quo. So, I, I, don't, I don't think I don't think you can separate. You can't separate. In my, to my mind, it's very difficult to separate um, capitalism from colonization. It's also very difficult to separate um, capitalism or neoliberalism from heteronormativity. Yeah. So they're all kind of interwoven. So it's all. So therefore, um, in reality, the in in um, the very fact of of queer people and and non-white people existing, the exi- surviving and and living and existing, is in itself an act of resistance for people who want to be who the the neoliberal capitalist system want to eliminate. Yeah, well said. Um, we were talking about this earlier. How this this book kind of uh, is a bit of a conversation between two futures. Uh, there's there's a um, there's a closed in uh, surveillance state um, horror story, um, which can be a utopia for some, as you've established. But um, at what cost? Uh, and and another another future you present takes the best of um, modern economic thinking and it takes the best of um, climate tech solutions and it kind of weaves them into another possibility. Um, Can you tell me what you can about that possibility without spoiling the book and, um, and, and do you postulate like what direction we go in the the, the funny thing is that to, m- to my mind the main difference between safe town and the utopian melbourne in the novel um is um the main difference between them is the size of the of the in group see mm. a utopia is a utopia only for the in group if the in group contains everybody it's utopia for everybody and that's kind of that that was what i was trying to look at what would be a utopia if if the utopia is let's make a, let's make the in group big and include also include the environment itself, and of course the um, these solutions to the um, environmental crisis um, in in this kind of this utopian future that I imagine none of them are new inventions. It's just a, it's just a difference in will and how you want to you, you utilize what you've got, um, and some of the ideas that are that are being used are. Um, so-called green building cities where you turn buildings into vertical gardens which is actually possible they do it in singapore already they've got apartment buildings in singapore that have got planter boxes all around, all around the outside of them that's kind of a that concept works as a way to build a a city that's environmental environment impact is to bring the bring the forest into the city mm. and people often say that a solution to climate change is you know to put to plant forests on the on the land Outside the city, but that's the, we're growing food in those areas. If you plant plants out those areas, you lose the food supply. And in reality, most of the land in a urban environment is useless. Yeah. For environmentally, it's useless. It's it's dead land. But not if you, if you, for example, on the roof of every undercover car park in Sydney, were to put a garden. Yeah, that's not that, not that, that difficult, and that would be a. The sort of solution that would actually work, and it's something we could do. And I remember, I can't remember where it was, but I remember seeing a newish building in Sydney a couple of years ago, which was a vertical garden on a building. Yeah, I think I think I know the one. It's I can't beautiful. Remember. It's in it, the it's in the city. It's, right it's near the ABC building in yeah. Sydney. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's possible. Yep. And that, that's just one example of what would, what happens when you think about how you can. It's not. It's when I suppose the way to put it is the. Fault of environmental damages we're doing are not a lack of ability, but they're a lack of willpower, the lack of a will to do the right thing. And if you shift it so that we, we ha- everyone has the will, then we'll, we can do good things. That's a brilliant note to kind of end on. Uh, what, what can we expect next from Clergy Coleman? Well, I'm, I'm researching a book on Indigenous art and how to... Uh, 
and and how to put it in context so you can better understand what you're looking at when you look at the art. Uh, I'm doing the research for that. And I have my next novel in mind finally. I, I didn't have an idea for years and the idea mugged me a couple of weeks ago, so I'll probably write in that as well. So there's still more things to come. We cannot wait. Glad you comment. Your new book is called Enclave. There's signed copies from a limited time from booktobia.com.au and you should totally read all of Claire's books. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Now over to Ben's interview with Paul Daly, author of Jesus Town, which you can purchase in the description right now from booktopia.com.au. Hello, I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's Fiction Category Manager, and with me today is Paul Daly. He's a columnist for The Guardian Australia and winner of multiple Walkley Awards. Uh, He's also a short story writer, an essayist, and a playwright. Uh, and he has a new novel. It's called Jesus Town. And um, over the last few weeks, I've just been becoming obsessed with it. So welcome, Paul. I look forward to speaking about it with you. Thanks very much. Jesus Town uh, takes readers face to face with some of the most challenging aspects of Australia as it exists today. Um, but at the same time, it's it's compelling and it's addictive to read. Uh, it's it's an enjoyable reading experience. Uh, and that's you know something I don't encounter all the time. Uh, that's that's an achievement. Um, so you you write regularly for the Guardian on Indigenous affairs. Um, what what drove you to approach that subject through the medium of novel? Really, I see the novel as a manifestation of that huge body of work I've done over over the past ten years or so. In that broad space of contested Australian history and uh, the really vexed, you know, capital B, black, white history. Um, And when I talk about the competing notions of Australian history, I'm talking about, you know, the sort of nation-defining history that I grew up with, which was Captain Cook, 1770, First Fleet, 1788, 1915... World War II versus what I now see as the real wars for Australia, which were the frontier wars, the colonial and, and post-colonial uh, violence that, um, that accompanied dispossession. So really, I've had my head in that space for a long time and then kind of thrown into that was this material I started coming across about uh, the theft of ancestral human remains, which was huge. It was virtually an industry right. for, for a long, long time. I got to the point where I'd already written a novel. My first novel was um, 20, 2014, and I'd written a number of other books. But I really felt like if I was going to still be a novelist in Australia, I had to deal with this, what I see as this big, the big questions of Australian history. So that's in broad terms where the novel came from. And, you know, plot came around that later uh, and characters um, characters became the scaffolding for that big story of, of Australian history which I, I like to call it. You've got some excellent characters telling this story. Uh, you've got a Patrick who is at the centre of uh, a crisis when you meet him and his, he then follows the footsteps of his grandfather in a way that um, you'll probably explain a bit uh, but they both have this same thing going on. They're, they're white blokes. Patrick is in London when we meet him. Um, and it's this grandiose kind of uh, self-aggrandisement or um, this belief in them as a, themselves as a, a hero or a kind of heretic in a less-than-perfect Western world who's there to improve things. Uh, and, and, and Paul's particular... Uh, sorry, your Paul. Uh, Patrick's particular profession is a popular historian if you put it that way uh can you can you tell me a, a bit about that that profession and and how it crumbles in around him because that's that's also the source of a lot of the, the humor in this book for me <laughs> yeah well I'm, I'm glad you i'm glad you could laugh at it because I, I i really saw the humor in these very kind of bleak situations myself but um sure i think one of the big questions around this 
big Australian history that I talk about at the moment is this tension between, let's call them the popular stories, the airport stories, where you see that wall of books, mostly by blokes, about, oh, yeah. about blokes in uniforms. Uh, and not all, but often, they're quite monodimensional stories of, you know, white-hatted Australians in very dangerous situations, uh, liberating people and, you know, becoming heroes. There's the tension between that and, I guess, the, the professional, mostly academic historians who started really sort of digging into the horror of the frontier in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, you know, anthropologists like Stenner and uh, historians like Henry Reynolds. Patrick is an academic historian, a very flawed one, a very kind of intellectually lazy one, but he sees the writing on the wall. He follows the money. Yes. And he starts to not really care about um, truth too much at all and he pursues these... Her heroic stories of um, uh, an ideal Australian, really, and it works for him until it doesn't. <laughs> and the point it doesn't is when he finds himself having to write about his grandfather, mm. who is an adventurer, journalist, autodidact, um, anthropologist, and, you know, purported saviour of a people. And... Bearing in mind that the white saviour trope is huge in Australian history too. White fellas saving black children, saving in inverted commas, in air quotes, you know, that sort of thing. Patrick is put into a very difficult circumstance where he has to try and uncover the truth about his grandfather and not, you know, his instinct is to write the story of my grandfather, the hero. Well, in some ways he was an heroic figure, but he was also very complex and Patrick finds himself totally ill-equipped to do that um, and in a circumstance where, you know, he's, he's not, it's not a hostile environment, but it's a, it's a very foreign environment to him, even though he's been there before. Yeah, it, 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 is, a, it is a return for Patrick when he, when he goes to this, this fictional place in the far north of the country, this community called Jesus Town. It's an old missionary town, right? Mm. Um, there's there's so much reluctance in Patrick to to go there, um, and it, and part of that is a, a complicated relationship with the grandfather, um, but there's there's so much more. So so what's what's going through his mind when the plane touches down for him? So something terrible's happened to him in in London, and I, I don't think it's a spoiler because it's in the on the on the cover to say that his his infant son has died, and. So he's grieving and he's also self-medicating to cope with that. He's jet-lagged uh, and he's got this terrible memory of this place, Jesus Town, from his last visit there when he was a kid. He, I think he was 16 or 17, uh, about to do his year 12. And he had a very bad experience with, um, with his grandfather on that last visit, which really you know, marred his memory of his grandfather. But mm. all the men in this family are ridiculously messed up. He's got a very complicated relationship with his own father, who was the son of Rennie, the great yes. anthropologist, and they were estranged as well. So really he is going into a place he doesn't want to be in, in a state of extreme emotional stress. Um, but he's going there to write a book about his grandfather and to tackle what he is assured is a quite well curated um, archive, mm. <laughs> but turns out to be the archivist's nightmare. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I, w I want to pause on is, is when, when he gets to this place, uh, he hasn't been there in decades and not a lot has changed, but some things have changed. Um, one thing he, he, he's encountered with is, is that he's not the only white bloke in town. There are other travellers or um, people who have made their way there and he feels, uh, he feels things about that. 
and there's again the 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 wry humor of this book and um the taking the reader to difficult places uh that that exists in that so can, can we talk about those those outsiders yeah sure um i mean i think you could go to many indigenous communities or aboriginal and torres strait islander communities in australia remotely or in the cities and you would find um people who are fascinated with aboriginal people and culture and gravitate towards them you know often for the most um enlightened and positive of reasons sometimes less so um because they see an opportunity and patrick is incensed by a couple who he meets uh who are staying on what he regards as his grandfather's property right of course it's aboriginal land always was um but patrick doesn't quite see it that way and he takes umbrage at this couple for <laughs> for staying on on this land that he sees as his grandfather's and um not quite understanding the irony that they are welcomed there by the um by the custodians um but it's a bit double edged because the custodians can also see that these people might be taking advantage of them absolutely but they are willing to tolerate them as is often the case and they're tolerating patrick as well <laughs> they are certainly <laughs> i think i think the humor in it is is just seeing seeing him try and take the moral high ground on anything yes. <laughs> in his current state um so he he goes into this archive um uh and it's as you say it's a it's an absolute shit show it's a mess um but uh the prize possession he eventually chances on are these these tapes that um his grandfather recorded late in life um in a state of uh <laughs> you know in and out of lucidity uh and it's somewhat of a confession about you know what his journey actually was, um, and you know, as for a historian, that's that's really a gold mine, right? Um, it's a first-hand account, um, and so you take the reader into this space with Patrick as he um, drinks himself stupid and takes sleeping pills, and then plays these tapes of his grandfather who is near death, and it's a kind of it's a liminal space, you know. Like, who's, who is that? The voice in those tapes, and 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 what, what is he trying to tell you? Took me a long time to nail the voice in those tapes. Um, it's because the character of Rennie is not any single anthropologist who operated in in that time frame. Um, sure, he reflects some individual experiences of many and reflects some elements of things that happened but it's not a piece of history and Rennie wasn't a bloke that I knew the voice came to me in the end after I spent some time with um quite an old man that I know well um and I decided in the end that the only way I could write the book was through the first person voice of both men there are a number of reasons for that but I guess the thing about it too was when I was getting lost in imagining these tapes myself I didn't know what was true I didn't know what Rennie's truth was and I don't think you do in mm. the same way that I don't think you know what Patrick's truth is I don't know if Patrick wrote the book um I really don't I don't know that he was capable other people who have read it say yeah yeah he wrote the book I want him to have written the book but um you know, I think that reflects a desire to sort of tie things up neatly. Yes. And I don't think this book is tied up neatly plot-wise at all. No, no. It, it, it certainly pulls the reader through, but you walk away from this book at the end um, <laughs> it's carrying a lot. <laughs> you, you give, you kind of hand it over to the reader and, and, and the reader takes it and uh, you just have to sort of sit and weigh, weigh with that. Uh what, do you have um, a personal experience of, of visiting remote communities um, in the interior or the far north of the country? And um, if, if, if so, what are the assumptions that um, even the more uh, liberal-minded uh, uh, city-dwelling Australian gets wrong? Um, I have visited some, 
Um, and I started actually writing a novel in a fairly remote community uh, five or six years ago. But it's not about that community. Um, you know, I had to... I went to great efforts to geo-dislocate yep. where this book was actually set, where Jesus Town was. And Jesus Town is sort of everywhere and nowhere north of the Brisbane line, really. It's wherever you want it to be. Um, and one of the assumptions that I think even the most well-meaning people who come to these communities and um, want to have an experience what they might call a genuine experience of Aboriginal culture, one of the mistakes they make is that, well, that's not the only place where there is real Aboriginal culture. Real Aboriginal culture is lived. It's everywhere. Mm. You know, it's not in museums, uh, although, you know, cultural items may be. Um, it's not in one of half a dozen communities across the north of Australia. It's everywhere. It's in Sydney. It's in Melbourne. It's in Adelaide, it's in Perth, it's in Tasmania, in the cities and the regions. I think one of the mistakes uh, a lot of people, journalists included, make is to see real Aboriginal um, culture as only in remote places. Yeah. Uh, on, on the subject of cultural artefact, human remains, uh, artwork, things that have been... Uh, taken and as, as you say as it, it was done on an industrial scale absolutely um, and there was big profit made uh, what what is what is the existing consequence uh, as you see it for 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 communities in indigenous Australia today for that theft there's a real imperative in so many communities to have their dead their stolen dead and they were stolen um, return to them. So, for example, there's a there's a room in a storage facility on the outskirts of Adelaide that belongs to the South Australian Museum. Um, I've written about this room. I've been in it twice, and it contains the remains in cardboard boxes of 4,600 individuals, or it did um, when when I was in there both times. Since then. I think 260 sets of those Aboriginal remains have been reburied in Ghana country, in Adelaide, uh, and there's about to be another reburial. So long answer to your, to your question is that there is an absolute imperative to return those remains to the soil from which they were dug up and stolen because, um, because that is the spiritual imperative. The spirit doesn't rest. Mm. until um, the remains go back into the earth from which they came. And from which they came in a, um, uh, in a spiritual sense too and in an in, in a Aboriginal cosmological sense. You know, the, 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 the human spirit comes from the ground into the mother's womb, um, often, often from a puddle or um, a source of water. And so the remains have to go back to that place. That's why this is why notions of country are sort of more than just country in a, um, in a geographic sense. Yeah. You know, they're multi-layered. It's, there's a spiritual dimension, an historical dimension, um, a cosmological dimension. And the body and the spirit are all tied up with that. This is a work of, of fiction, Jesus Town, and it, as we've covered, it's set in a fictionalised community. Uh, but even still, uh, as as both a, a, a journalist and as a novelist in this case, uh, how do you approach writing this subject with sensitivity? Uh, by always having the starting point of respect um, and by passing really intensely how I would write Aboriginal characters. So I would never inhabit an Aboriginal character and I would not even write them in the end omnisciently. And I spoke before about why I wrote this book through um, two first-person voices, which is 
not a normal thing to do, I don't think. I think it's a little unconventional. I'm not saying I've you know, invented the wheel here, but the reason I did that in this case after thinking about it and discussing it with a lot of people was that I could only write Aboriginal characters through white eyes. I'm a white guy. I'm, I'm not Indigenous. Um, and the two white protagonists are flawed, deeply flawed individuals, and... I could only respect the Aboriginal people in this story by writing them from that vantage point, even though I think, and many of my friends who read it say that they feel like the Indigenous characters or the Aboriginal characters are familiar and, you know, respectfully drawn. Mm. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, We're almost out of time, uh, but I... I really want to get to one more thing and, and really just get your opinion on it. Um, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm from a family that is like Anglo-Australian on both sides, multi-generations, uh, and I went to school in the Howard era um, mm-hmm. and in school we were taught that uh, Australia is a great country. We started with a boat, not a war, and that the only conflict that ever took place on Australian soil um, was the Eureka Stockade. Mm. Um and that's just, that's not true. <laughs> it's not true, no. Uh, uh, education matters. Um, and I want to know, I guess, do you have an opinion on, on, on a better way to share the truth of colonial trauma uh, with the next generation? But is there a way to do that uh, that encourages truth-telling, that encourages healing, uh, rather than inciting... Uh, you know, more misinformation or um, more shame and, 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 and inflaming the so-called history wars or culture wars? Look, I think things have changed a lot since the Howard era, thankfully. Um, and the intensity of the culture wars back then over, I think John Howard called it black armband history mm. um, or Geoffrey Blaney called it that, but Howard, um, Howard embraced it. Um, I think things have evolved a lot since then. I think um, our kids, I talk about my kids, for example, I've got um, uh, three kids, but one, one of the youngest is uh, 24, one of the other youngest is 16. They are much more conversant with what happened on the frontier than I was because I wasn't at all. Yeah. Um, you know, I finished school in the early 1980s and I did Australian history and then I went to university and I didn't know any any of this material. I think um, as a writer, I feel like as a non-Aboriginal writer that I have something of a responsibility to, to, to write about this part of an Australia that too many people for too long have not wanted to know about because I think it's unfair to lump all of the responsibility with black writers um i don't think that we should assume that they should have to tell it all because it is a it is a shared and very difficult history um i think one thing we can all do is listen at the moment i think and i feel like the country is listening more and i think that's reflected in a lot that's been said since the change of government i think It's really interesting that um, implementing the call from Uluru um, for a voice to parliament was really front and centre of a lot of what um, Anthony Albanese said during the campaign. And it was kind of item one on his to-do list on um, election night. Now, there's a lot of disagreement in uh, amongst different Aboriginal people about whether that is the best way forward and what that's going to look like. But we are having a a conversation now about this. Previous government wasn't going to do it. Yeah, and there's a will to do something. There's a real will to do something. And, you know, more people are talking about it. There's there's greater engagement with the argument across the political spectrum and across the media spectrum too, Mm. which which is great. I mean, you know, we're not all dividing over... Um, left-right lines on on this question anymore. So 
I think it's got a way to go, but I really think that there's going to, going to be a lot more said and a lot more books written in this space um, by, by writers who really want to make a difference. Your book is Jesus Town. It's published by Alan and Omlin. Paul Daly, it's been bloody excellent speaking to you. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. You can get a copy from booktopia.com.au right now. And now, finally, over to Sarah's interview with Kate Forsyth, author of The Crimson Thread, which you can purchase in the description right now from booktopia.com.au. Hi, I'm Sarah McDooling, and I am honestly overjoyed to be here today with the ever-wonderful and always amazing Kate Forsyth, um, best-selling author of many, many magical and wonderful books, um, including Bitter Greens, The Wild Girl and The Blue Rose, and lots of others that are, funnily enough, in my um, list of favourite ever's. <laughs> and, but you are here today to talk to us about your new book, The Crimson Thread. Thank you so much for having me. It's <laughs> always a joy to see you, Sarah. Oh, so for everyone listening, before I start um, sending a barrage of questions your way, would you like to just give listeners a little overview of what they can expect in The Crimson Thread? I would love to. So The Crimson Thread is a historical novel for adults and it reimagines the Minotaur in the Labyrinth myth set in Crete during World War II. It begins with the invasion of the Nazis in May 1941 and then travels through the occupation and the valiant attempts of the Greek resistance to, to oust the Germans from their island. Uh, I am fresh off reading this book. I actually just finished the last bit that I hadn't read yet last night. I started it on Sunday night. So I tried to parcel it out a little bit because I don't, when, when there's a book I'm really looking forward to reading um, and it just, you read it in one sitting, it's sort of sad because then it's, <laughs> then it's done. So I lived, I lived with the book for a few days and I absolutely, absolutely loved it. And I, I wondered, you know, one thing that I... I always kind of, I guess, have come to expect with your books and admire so much with your books is the way you approach a retelling, which is always, you know, um, well, often uh, a subtle retelling. It's like a, mm. a, it's a, a whole new story that just sort of has its roots buried in a, in a myth or a legend. And so I kind of wanted to ask how you, what first drew you to the, the Minotaur and the Labyrinth and, um, and how did that kind of connect up with Alenka's story uh, mm. in that first spark? So to um, explain how I came to be fascinated by the Minotaur and the Labyrinth myth, we need to go back into my childhood. Um, when I was a, a, about 13, my parents were getting a very acrimonious divorce and my sister, my brother and I, we were all sent off to various relatives over the summer holidays while my parents went through this this you know terrible disruption to our lives um, I was sent to stay down with my father's parents my grandparents in Melbourne it was one of those incredibly blazing hot summers it was so hot and there was nothing to do but lie around and drink ice water with lemon in it and read which is kind of like a perfect summer holiday for me absolutely <laughs> Um, so I, whenever I go anywhere, I always used to pack my bag full of books and I read every book that I'd taken within like the first three or four days. <sighs> and then, then I had the great terror, what shall I do, what can I read? So my grandmother said to me, well, I've got a, book, a box of old children's books up in the attic and they got it out for me and it was like a treasure box. It was all my aunts and uncles' childhood books. And I'm rummaging through and I pull out two books the first one was called The Chalet School in Exile. And The Chalet School is um, this series, of, there's about 5,000 of them, about an English girls' school um, in, in Austria. And this particular one um, is set during the Anschluss. It's, it's when the Nazis came into Austria. Um, and these English schoolgirls get themselves in trouble with the Gestapo and have to flee. And they, um, they escape through this long kind of network of secret caves and then have to escape through the Alps. And they're being hunted by the Gestapo. The, the teacher who travelled with them, when she went into the 
caves. Her hair was long and chestnut brown, and when she came out, it was pure white. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. So I, I just devoured this book in a single afternoon, and I'd never really read anything quite like it. It was my first kind of real English schoolgirl and my first story about the war. And that night, sitting up and having dinner with my grandparents, just me and my grandparents, I told them in some excitement about this story, you know, the Gestapo and the Nazis were hunting them, they had to escape through the Alps and, you know, it was so dangerous and exciting. And my grandfather said to me, oh, yes, well, that actually happened to your great uncle, um, except it was in Crete, not in Austria. And I, and I went, oh, I've never heard of Crete before. It was just an, a word. And then he told me this incredibly dramatic story about how the Australian New Zealand soldiers um, sailed from Australia to Europe and then they were sent to fight newly, like, you know, freshly trained in Greece. And Mussolini had failed and so Nazi just sent in his things and they overran Greece in days and all the Anzacs had to flee and retreat and they left Athens, which was just a bombed-out, smoking ruin, and, w- and went to Crete, where they had a week or two to try and recover. But then Hitler hit Crete. It was the first airborne invasion in history. So they came at dawn in planes, and then seven or 8,000 parachuters just jumped down, landed on Crete, and, and took over the island. And the Australian New Zealand soldiers were taken virtually by surprise. And then they fought without respite for the next 11 days and finally l- lost the battle, were, you know, ragged, starving, they had no food, they had no weapons, they had no ammunition left, they had no radios, and they were hunted over the White Mountains of Crete, which are about 4,000 uh, metres in height and covered in snow even in summer. And they are vertiginous. I've never seen mountains like them. There was one road and about 37,000 Anzac soldiers had to walk over the mountains while they were being bombed by the Luftwaffe and chased by the Germans. And you can just imagine me, like I wasn't eating, I was just riveted. (laughs) I was only 12 or 13, maybe 14, I can't remember. And I'm just riveted. And my great uncle, whose um, name was Jerry which is my father's name, he was only 21 years old. Oh, my so God. So he was, he was like maybe l- less than a decade older than I was then, being hunted. He had no shoes, he'd lost his boots, he was barefoot, he was wounded, he was, you know, they were starving. Um, they got to the other side of the mountains on the south coast of Crete and then they were hiding in, in caves while they were being hunted by the Nazis, and then every night for three nights, the British Navy would sail at high speed. As soon as the sun set, they would sail out from Alexandria in Egypt, come as fast as they could to Crete, cram as many of these poor, exhausted, wounded uh, soldiers, and then race back. And the Luftwaffe, as soon as the sun came over, they'd be there bombing them, and about a quarter of all the ships ended up on the bottom of the ocean. Now, my great-uncle escaped. He got off the island. But about 7,000, mainly Australian and New Zealand soldiers, were abandoned, just left behind. They couldn't get them off the island. And they were hidden by the people of Crete at enormous, enormous risk to themselves in caves and cellars and, and bombed-out ruins, some of them for almost two years. You know, and the atrocities, the reprisals against anyone found sheltering an Anzac were, you know, completely, complete annihilation, really. So this story just completely, completely ripped my imagination. And it was reinforced by the fact that my grandfather also told me that um, Jerry's brother, who was also, he actually fought in Papua New Guinea, um, both Jerry and his brother came back from the war completely, completely shattered men. And um, Jerry's brother, my other great uncle, um, one day he went out for milk and he never came home. He just disappeared. Oh. And no one has ever known what happened to him. He left behind a wife and small children. And, th- th- you know, they, he, was he dead? Had he, had he run away? We have never found the answer. So that story really, as you can imagine, really had a powerful effect on me as a, as a girl. Now, the very next day, I began to read the second book, 
which I'd plucked out of this treasure box of old books. And it was Tales of the Greek Heroes oh, by wow. Roger Lancelin Green. And um, the story, The Adventures of Theseus, which is what he called it, was story number 14. And it's, of course, it's a story of, of how the hero Theseus uh, volunteered himself to go to Crete um, because... Uh, seven young men and seven young women had to be sacrificed to feed the Minotaur in the labyrinth every seven years. And he he went to Crete and then um, he fell in love or, um, with with Ariadne, the, the, the mistress of the labyrinth, and she taught him the secret to get in and out of the labyrinth. And he went in and he fought and killed the Minotaur. Now, um, Crete... I heard the word Crete twice in two days, um, one in this story of courage and struggle and, and, and incredible heroism, and then again the story of magic and danger and you know this kind of mythic story. So it really established Crete in my imagination as a place of, um, of wonder and mystery and magic. And I got obsessed with Crete. I read everything that I could find, um, you know. So I was reading, um, you know, Mary Renault and, and um, you know, Mary Stewart and um, all sorts of books that were set in Crete. Um, and that's what first began, gave me my obsession with labyrinths and, and minotaurs and, and, and quite possibly monsters. And so really the seeds for this story trace all the way back to, to that yeah. Time. That's amazing. I know. Um, and I, I hadn't ever really thought about writing a book set in Crete at all, except that I've always loved the Greek myths and I kind of have read them and studied them for many, many years. Then um, about three years ago, I was um, on tour for my novel, The Blue Rose, and I was, I was driving, I think it was to Albury, this little country town, and with beautiful big wide streets and I'm looking for my hotel and then I see a second hand bookshop you know one of the old ones and I just pull and it had a car park right in front of it <laughs> and I just pulled up in front of it how could you not how could <laughs> I not I love old old bookstores and I wandered in and it was like a magical place you know dusty dark a bit cobwebby Books piled everywhere, and the man behind the desk was just reading, you know, <laughs> kept on reading. So I had a happy hour or so browsing in this old, old bookstore, and I found the most amazing treasure. It's called Tanglewood Tales, and it's written by Nathaniel Hawthorne, who's better known for, you know, The Scarlet Letter. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. This it was a first edition. Whoa. I know. First edition. Some of these pages had never been cut. You know how in old-fashioned books oh you had to gosh. cut the pages to read them, and it was um, illustrated by Maxwell Parrish, who you, you know what I am like about art. I I used to have a painting of Maxwell Parrish's of Prometheus hanging on my wall when I was a uni student, and this is the book that it came from. Oh my god! First edition. Just sitting there. Just sitting there. Waiting for you. Going, Kate, <laughs> Kate. And I, I heard it siren call as I was driving through the town. I got lost <laughs> and pulled up and the car park was waiting for me. I walked in, I found this book. It was not cheap. But I thought, you know what? It's Worth mine. It. It's mine. So I bought it. And after I'd done my, my speech that night, I can't remember what I was doing, maybe at a library or um, a literary dinner, I went back to my very cold, small little hotel motel room and I read it and it's brilliant. And story number seven was the Minotaur. And I'm reading this again and as I'm reading it, I'm beginning to see like I images in my head. It has this phase, it, it has this moment where and then Theseus saw rising out of the darkness the far blue mountains of Crete. And I felt this shiver run down my spine, the far blue mountains of Crete. And then I began to imagine the story. Right. But for me, most people, I think, would have been thinking about doing what I would call a literal 
retelling, which mm. i.e. there is actually a man with a bull's head and there is actually a, libera- a, a labyrinth and there is a real, you know, Ariadne and Theseus. And I love literal retellings of myths and fairy tales. Um, and, um, you know, I, I plan to write my own. But because of my great uncle's experiences during World War II, for me, it was a World War II story. And um, to explain why, apart from the fact that it was my own family history, I'm really fascinated by the function that monsters have in, in stories. Um, this is one of the things that draws me to, um, to fairy tales and mythology and folklore. These, these ancient, ancient stories that have been told for thousands and thousands of years. They're, they're warnings and the word monster comes from the ancient Greek monere, that means to warn. Oh. And other words that come from the same root are things like monitor, which means to, to, to watch. watch over, oh. and admonish, to warn someone not to do something, <gasps> and summon, summon oh, wow. is to call someone secretly. This is fascinating. Isn't this? It, it's good. It's rich, isn't it? And so um, in, in my kind of, in my more academic studies, um, I'm drawn to this idea that monsters are metaphors for us. We, we project our own fears onto monsters. And a really good example of this is um, the vampire craze with Anne Rice yeah. in the 80s where, you know, we were um, having the, 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 the dreadful AIDS epidemic, a lot of fear about blood and sharing of blood and, and bodily fluids and, and dying and, dying yeah. and death. And, and vampires, these immortal things that drink blood, um, they were the monster for that generation. Yeah. Now, to me, um, the Minotaur, um, psychologically speaking, is um, a symbol of humanity's deepest fears and darkest desires. And to me, what is the most dreadful manifestation of the greed for hunger you know, and hunger for power and land and control? War. Yeah. And so for me, the, metaf- the, the Minotaur was always going to be a metaphorical Minotaur. And so he stands for, I mean, who decides that there's an island where people are living happily and peacefully um, and just because it's a good place where you could land your plans, planes while you take over the world, you drop 10,000 armed men who go out there and kill until everyone gives in. Uh-huh. That to me is um, the worst of human hunger for power and control and um, and and evil. So, my miniature There's story miniature. had to be set in World War Two. That's part of what I really loved about the way you approached this retelling and the way you expressed through particular characters the the uh, terrible effect of war and what a, um, what a monster it makes out of people. Um, this is one of those moments where I just start talking about things that I like and I forget that I'm in a podcast and I yeah. should be asking you questions. But they're but the yeah. best conversations. <laughs> <laughs> but I, read, I found that really powerful, particularly, you know, with, with characters like Teddy and Axel and the ways in which, like, this insidious evil can sort of creep in and corrupt. Mm. Um, it was just so well done. It's like such a beautiful book. Oh, thank it gave you, Sarah. All the emotions. Like it, it's. We were talking a bit before the podcast about light and dark, and and both are so present in this book, and the full gamut of emotions, like so horrific things, but just also beautiful things, mm-hmm. and um, and so romantic. And I mean, of course, you have a, a wonderful, brave, beautiful main character in Alenka. Um, but I have to confess that I completely lost my heart to the character of Jack and I wondered if we could just spend a moment to, to just like talk about Jack and how cool he is. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I'm so glad that you love Jack because I love Jack as well. You know, um, I'm, I'm in love with Jack um, and th- this will kind of 
sound a bit odd, but um, in in Jack, I imagined what I thought my great uncle might have been like. A young man, he was only twenty one, yeah. you know, which is the same age as my son is now, and you know, such a baby. And um, m- my my grandfather, um, who t- who first told me the story about Crete, he was just the most gentle, um, lovely man. Um, he. During the war, he worked for the RAAF and he was a crypto analyst. And so he, he never left Australia. He, he worked up in Darwin and he listened with the headphones on and to the secret codes of the Japanese and in Morse code and then um, deciphered them. Wow. Um, and he was a musician. Um, he, he said that uh, they were called the pianists because um, to send Morse code and to interpret Morse code, you, you, they all had these like long pianist Tapping hands. Fingers, yeah. <laughs> um, but he, um, he actually played in a jazz band in, um, after the war in Melbourne, one of the very first jazz clubs in Melbourne. He played the double bass. And when I was a little girl, every time I would stay with him, he would get out his double bass and he would sit there and he could play any music that he'd heard once. Wow. I know. I mean, what a gift. Ah, I'd love to try to do that. And he couldn't understand that we couldn't do it. Like he'd play us a piece of music and then he would just pick up his bow. And um, I can remember he used to play me The Flight of the Bumblebees. Oh, that's awesome. Which is so (laughs) much fun. (laughs) So much fun. And as a little girl, I would just sit there cross-legged at his feet and I could see bumblebees dancing in the... You know how you you get those little (laughs) motes of of dust in in the light? They had all the curtains closed so the hot sun wouldn't bleach their oh, furniture wow. so i'd have these shafts of light with mo- with motes of dust floating them and they would look like bumblebees i used to love it so much so jack in the crimson thread i've given him a lot of my uh, of my grandfather's arthur's kind of character he loved um his garden and he grew these amazing vegetables that my Grandmother used to cook for him all the time. Um, he could play. He loved music and he played. He was um, he was quite shy and serious, but when he knew you, he was very funny and um, just brilliantly, brilliantly clever. He, look, he's a, he's a beautifully realised character. I really like... I The saddest part about finishing the book was, um, you know, those characters are now... I mean, they're living on in my head, yeah. but I'm not, like, hanging out with them anymore. It was just wonderful, wonderful to be with them. And I just love – I'm such a sucker for a, a romance, and mm. the romance in this is really beautiful. Like, <laughs> Well, it's a real love triangle, and I haven't ever really done a love triangle before in the same mm. way. Um, and for, for the love triangle to actually really work, um, it's not just that you have two men who are – rivals for a woman's love but the relationship between Teddy and Jack was also part of the the dynamic of of um complex feelings between them because you know Jack and and Teddy had been best friends since they were like eight and Teddy had always been the leader and Jack had always been his faithful shadow and for Jack to to stand up and you know oppose teddy and yeah. and um guard alenka and and reveal his feelings was actually very difficult for him to do and so that that part was the the, the part of the journey watching jack come to the point where he was able to stand up and tell alenka that he loved her that to me was one of the most important scenes in the book I just got shivers when you were talking about it because it is a real blossoming for Jack throughout this book. Mm. Even just allowing himself to beat Teddy at things, something he's obviously held back mm. from. Um, watching him gain the confidence and um, self-belief to kind of go after what he wanted was really was really wonderful. And like also hearing you talk, it was striking me how this book, you know, it is full of music, it's full of poetry... It's it's kind of this epic love song to knowledge and mm-hmm. and art. Everything is in there as well. Like one minute we're talking about Buck and then we're talking about 
uh, detective novels and then we're talking about the Fibonacci spiral and then like it's just I feel like yes yeah (laughs) the book is just swimming in like Mm. this love for for knowledge and art and beauty and um and I feel like that I, I think it's part of the reason I love reading your book so much I mean not to get too like um fangirly I can't help it but like I feel like there's a real difference between because often you can be reading a book and then you get to the part of the book where um you consciously feel that an author is saying and here's some research right Mm. and like I I never feel that way when I'm reading your books I feel swept up and I feel like I learn things um and like I'll carry the the knowledge of what you told me um about Morse code and music and um and the Fibonacci spiral like, I'm going to carry that with me I've learned it from reading your mm. book and um at no point was I ever sort of jostled out of this story I just lived in it and um one of the things that I, I kind of hope is that um when things come together at the end suddenly you see why they're there in the book but because they've been you know I want it to feel so natural so um it unfolds so in such a way that when you see how Jack uses the Fibonacci um, ratio and how he uses his love of poetry and the poems that he Alenka has shared with him, then all of a sudden it's, it, it, it just feels so right. That's, that's what I'm trying to it's do. It's completely organic when you're mm. reading and it, it just feels so natural and working. And, and as well, another thing in this book that mm. comes through is the embroidery and like... Yeah. And which obviously ties in with the title, and like, and another thing I learnt while reading this book is um, the the expression like how we would say knock on wood, but the Greeks would say grab some red mm-hmm. or something like that's an amazing thing. I'm not going to forget that. I know it because I read this beautiful book, and the etymology of the word clue. In fact, can you tell the listeners <laughs> this because this is so cool? I <laughs> I must admit I. I do really love this. So in the um, original mythology, um, Ariadne gives the hero Theseus um, a spool of, of blood red thread um, to, and she holds one end and then he holds the other end while he makes his way through the labyrinth, fights with the minotaur and then he, can, he, he, he winds it up as he follows his path back out again. Now in the original story, it's called a clue of thread which is spelt C L E W, and um, this actually means a spool of thread. But um, our word "clue," meaning a clue in a murder mystery or a clue that a detective finds that helps him solve a mystery, the word "clue" actually comes from the clue of thread in Ariadne's labyrinth. To follow it through, to find yeah. it's so cool. Like this is yeah. the. Uh, the Crimson Thread, and I will say all of your books are full of this kind of um, beautiful, wonderful, just I- I- tidbits of information mm. that all weave so perfectly into the story. I mean, it makes the experience of the book so wonderful. I was doing a book um, event last night and one of the questions from the audience um, was something very much along the lines of what she was saying. And um, she said, so often when I read historical fiction, it feels like the author has kind of copied and pasted, you know, out of an encyclopedia, some, you know, six paragraphs. And it just feels um, like, you know, I'm being lectured. And she said, "Um, when I read your book, I forget that I'm reading. I'm just so totally absorbed. And then I feel um, like I'm learning everything I need to know for the story to make sense. But at the end of the book, when I'm finished, I suddenly realise that I've had this incredible education. And, I, and, and she says, I feel like I could lecture on the, the history, the culture and the mythology of Crete now, a place I've never been. Yeah. How do you do it? And I was going, oh, you know, well, it's so lovely of you. Thank you so much. And then I said, well, I think it's because um, I do this deep, what I call a deep, immersive reading for a long time before I start writing so I read everything I can find about the place that I'm setting a story I read um, you know history non-fiction I read creative non-fiction I read memoir I read novels of the time and what and novels written now about that place but it's more than that I cook the food I listen to the music I read the poems and um you know, hear the songs that 
my characters would have been listening to. I try and learn the dances. Wow. Um, so with Alenka and her embroidery, which is such an in- integral part of the book, I um, I was inspired to have her. You know, she sews secret codes um, onto onto her wedding quilt, and she smuggles information out of the Wehrmacht offices to to the resistance. And where I get the idea that you could sew in secret code? Well, it was when I was um, in um, Crete. I saw everywhere this beautiful Greek embroidery that they do. Um, I saw that during the war, women were sewing images of the Nazi invasion into their... Because they sewed what they saw. Yeah. And then um, I just grew completely fascinated by the art of embroidery and discovered that it has actually been a subversive art where women have used it to express themselves and their true lives for thousands of years. Wow. And I, I, I had never known that before. So I had to learn to embroider because <laughs> how could I describe Alenka embroidering unless I you know, knew how to do it. And, you know, I've never sewn a stitch in my life. And now, oh, my God, I'm I'm addicted. I love this. You're like a, a method writer. I'm a method writer. <laughs> That's exactly what I call myself. I'm a method writer. And it's one reason why it takes me so long to write a book because, I, uh, you know, I'm doing this method. I'm living in a Lenka's skin for months and months and months until I feel ready. And then I... It's like you internalise everything so you know it and then you just write as if you'd always lived there. Does that make sense? It, well, it, I've read the book so I'm just going to say it pays off because mm-hmm. I felt transported there. I f- there's just this like magical quality to the – I mean, I, just last night I was um, in wartime Crete. Like I I felt that I was there. I believe in these characters. There's, a, there's just a real um, – vivid, tangible quality to the story that I think must come from how deeply you immerse yourself in the world and the culture. And um, and it's a gift. And, like, we again, we, we did discuss this before the podcast. Um, anyone who hasn't read the book yet, um, in the acknowledgements, you mentioned The Moon Spinners um, by Mary Stewart, and that was just wild to me to get to the end of the book and read that because the whole way through reading the book... You know, my only other point of reference for a, a, a beautiful love story with a bold, brave character in Crete was the Moon Spinners. And although there's sort of, aside from the setting, um, not really that that any kind of correlation between those two stories, what does come through in, in both is love of Crete. And mm. um, I've never been there, but I feel connected to it emotionally because of... Crete because is just the most amazing place. Um, it's It's... Um, I was trying to describe that. I was speaking to someone this week and saying Crete is one of those places you, you go somewhere sometimes and it feels haunted by the past and it feels ancient and powerful. So Uluru gave me a similar feeling. Being at Uluru, this inc- like it's, a, it's a sacred site and it's been at the heart of, um, you know, human... Uh, worship and human storytelling and humans' connection to the earth. Crete gives me the same kind of feeling, like it's really old and really mysterious and really beautiful and I'd never been anywhere quite like it before and parts of it are incredibly desolate. It could almost be like the moon, you know, um, the mountains. Like, I, you know, imagine those poor Anzac soldiers having to escape over... I was terrified. I, I was holding on to all of my children because it, they are so steep and huge and grim and embodied. Like, you, you you feel that there is a spirit in them and if they don't like you... You're in trouble. You're, you're in trouble. And I, I so understand how the Greek gods were invented and why the Greek gods are so terrible. When you're in a landscape like that, you know, yeah. and people have been dying there, they you know, it's been soaked in blood for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and yet every spring the flowers bloom once more. Wow! It's it's um, it's elemental. I'm going to have to go there. So. <laughs> and can I tell you, as an Aussie girl, 
I'm so used to swimming in the Pacific Ocean, which is huge and dark and powerful and you can't see your feet. The sea at, in Crete is crystalline clear. You can see fathoms deep. Wow. And when you're swimming and a eagle flies over your head, you see their shadow beneath you. F- on the floor of the ocean? On the floor of the ocean. Oh, my gosh. And you can see the roots of the mountain plunging down. It's incredible. I've wow. never s- and it's it's like swimming in champagne. It's so it's warm, not warm, it's cool, it's crisp, it's sparkling, it's effervescent, and it's crystal clear. Swimming in champagne, what a great analogy. I know. I loved it. I'd go back to Crete in a heartbeat. <sighs> Well, I mean, I think we're running a little bit over time, which I knew would happen because any time I speak to you, I just feel like I could keep going for hours and hours. Um, but we sort of probably need to start wrapping up. But before we do, um, and feel free to say that it's too early to talk about it, but I did want to ask about what you might have coming up next after The Crimson Thread. Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on an, a new novel. Um, I'm, I'm very slow to start because I spend so much time reading and thinking and daydreaming and doing that, that kind of deep, immersive research that I was just explaining Um, and that means that once I start to write I have a very strong sense of my story and I tend to write quite swiftly Um, but the the book that I'm working on now is called Psyche and it's a retelling um, it's a literal retelling of the Eros and Psyche myth so um, unlike The Crimson Thread which is a metaphorical retelling this one is actually about Psyche and Psyche's journey and um, her journey to the underworld. You know, Persephone is a character in in it. The great god Pan is a character in it. And I'm just trying to work out how I can get Pegasus in there. You're killing me. I like, I love any kind of retelling. I don't Mm. have a preference, but the idea of of you in particular doing a, a literal retelling of this particular myth as well, which I believe is like my favourite Greek it's myth. It's my favourite Greek <laughs> myth. And y- you know why we love it so much? It is one of the few Greek myths that has a woman at its heart. Oh. And it's one. I think it's the only one that's got a happy ending. In Greek mythology, women have their tongues cut out. <sighs> women have t- are turned into gorgons with snakes for hair. Women are, you know, turned into an echo Echo, 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 you know. (laughs) Psyche, Psyche is a woman of our times, you know. She loves, she's disobedient. It's all about woman, you know, feminine Mm. desire. It's all about, um, you know, someone who loves with every atom of her being. And then she loves so much that she's prepared to face death (sighs) to save her beloved and she goes down into the underworld. Can't wait to write that scene. Oh, Sarah, can you imagine? I can't wait to read it. She goes down <laughs> and there is Persephone on her throne, you know, the queen of the dead in the darkness of the underworld. And Psyche comes back to life. <sighs> oh, it's such a great story. It's so, so rich and it's got so many layers of meaning in it. And Psyche's name is, of course, the source of our psyche, our soul. And, um, you know, psychology and psychopomps and all those fabulous words that have psyche Oh, my God. It's going to be amazing. You you can tell I'm trembling with excitement at the prospect of writing it. I'm literally, like, almost levitating out of my Mm. chair at excitement at the thought of reading this book. And, Um, you know, um, psyche, Eros and Psyche is the source myth for Beauty and the Beast, one of my favorite fairy tales of course i love it so that yeah i've always i've always been a total slave for any kind of beauty in the beast yeah reference. yeah me too me too so oh. yeah it's going to be incredible so um i've written just in case any of my publishers are listening <laughs> i have actually written seven thousand words <gasps> and i'm in the midst of like Back to back events for the Crimson Thread, and I I wrote two thousand words yesterday. Oh my gosh! I, I just can't keep away from it. I'm addicted to it. It's wonderful. Oh, that it, all of that was just music to my ears. Thank you mm. so much for sharing. I will be looking forward to that book so much. But for everyone listening, the Crimson Thread is like about to go out into the world, and I cannot recommend it enough. Thank you, um, Kate. Thank you so, so, so much for for joining us today. It was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. 
Um, I always feel a little bit surreal sometimes when I remember that I have this job that allows me to <laughs> speak to these people whose whose work I love so much. And um, you know, I've been a fan of yours since reading Dragon Claw in high school, and so. It just seems wild to me sometimes that I get to chat with you. It's a real honour. When I say it's an honour, I'm saying that from the depths of my fangirl heart. Thank you, Sarah. (laughs) Well, you know how much I love to talk to you because we share such a passionate love of books and the same type of books. And um, The Crimson Thread is uh, a uniquely personal story to me because I'm drawing upon my own family history to write it. Um, And I put so much of myself into the book as well. And so it just makes me so happy that that you loved it. Oh, I, I adore it. And for everyone listening, you can grab your copy of The Crimson Thread as well as any number of Kate Forsyth's wonderful, delicious backlist, any of which I will heartily recommend, at your local bookstore or online at Booktopia. Thank you for listening and never stop reading. Thanks to Claire G. Coleman, Paul Daly and Kate Forsyth. You can find links to all books mentioned today in the description below. And if you're enjoying our show, you can drop us a review on Apple Podcasts, a like on Spotify, and let us know what you think. Join me this Thursday as I sit down with the host of Talking Aussie Books podcast, Claudine Tanellis, to discuss the books that she is reading and enjoying. Thanks for listening, and never stop reading.